computer. Okay, and uh, now I'm just gonna open all the doors to admit everybody. Does anyone have any questions before I open the doors up? No, okay. Alrighty, well, thank you all for joining us on the panel today. Thank you. Okay, so I'm admitting. Hello and welcome. Okay, I've put a message into the chat here. So please let us all know where you're from. Do we have anybody from Europe, from South America, from Asia, from Africa? Please let us know your location in the chat below and tell us, you know, what do you do? What kind of work do you do? So welcome. I see we've got Fernando, Jeffrey, Sunny, Toki, Lionel, Paola, welcome. Okay, great. Okay, we got some, okay, we got people from Mexico, from the Netherlands. Wow, nice. Okay. More people from Mexico, excellent, nice to meet you. We have some more people joining us. Welcome, Camilla, Johnson Johnson, and Lara. All right, welcome and feel free to put your location and job title here in the chat. Okay, we've got somebody from South Africa, Madagascar, wow, Philippines. Oh, and you're a teacher, cool. Hungary, excellent. We've got some graphic designers. Okay, welcome Sarah, welcome Susanna. All right. I'll just wait maybe one or two more minutes while we introduce ourselves here. We've got some people um, from the UK, a lecturer. We've got people in cloud solutions, an architect, financial analysts. Okay, welcome Janice, welcome Obina. Okay, wow, getting up to 27 people here today, that's awesome. I hope it's not too late for, for people who are ahead of uh, Vancouver time. So thank you for staying up late and joining us today. Okay, we've got Patricia. Welcome, Patricia. All right, Mio just finished their Master of Education. Congratulations. Okay. All right, I don't see anybody else left in the waiting room here. So maybe I'll just get started here with some introductions about BC Jobs and then I'll move over to the panel speakers. So welcome back everyone to our second hashtag Hire Me in Canada 2021 Immigration Guest Speaker Panel Series hosted by bcjobs.ca. Today, we are featuring Assassinating Immigration Law Center again, and newcomers to the panel can do Canadian Immigration Services and Walrus Immigration and Citizenship Services. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chelsea Sweeney, the Director of Events for BC Jobs, and your host today. Oh, I'm just gonna let a couple more people in. Okay. So I'll give you a quick intro on BC Jobs. BC Jobs is Western Canada's biggest online jobs board. We started this panel series, hashtag Hire Me in Canada 2021, to provide more information on finding work within Canada as an international <clears throat> job candidate. In addition to this immigration guest panel series, we also have our hashtag Hire Me 2021 guest speaker monthly series featuring BC and Canadian innovative companies. Our other events include annual virtual career fairs. Our next one will be sometime in 2022. We don't have a date confirmed yet for that. We also have our really cool innovators podcast available for you to listen to online on Spotify, Google podcast and Apple podcast. Okay, so before we get rolling with our panel introductions here, I just want to encourage um, everyone in the audience to type any questions that you may have for the panel speakers here into the chat and we'll get to them shortly during the audience Q&A. So about halfway through this event today. 
Uh, I know we'll, we have a lot of uh, people joining us, so we'll do our best to get through all the questions that you may have. Okay, so for panel introductions, I'd like to warmly welcome back Catherine Sass and Victor Ng, and warmly welcome Jamie Dalla and Linaj Kumar to this panel today. I'm gonna pass the, the virtual mic <laughs> over to Catherine Sass, uh, Queen's Council from Sassanine. Catherine, welcome back to our panel. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm an immigration lawyer and I've been practicing in Vancouver for 31 years. I do all aspects of immigration work other than going to the federal court for refugee claims. And uh, my colleague, Victor, he takes over the federal court side of the equation. And I'm very pleased to be with you here today. Thanks so much for joining us, Catherine. Okay, next up we have Jamie Dalla, RCIC from CANDU. Jamie, tell us a bit about your backstory. Hey, thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, so I'm actually a second generation involved in working with immigration. Uh, started back in the 90s. My father uh, started the company and I joined him in the 2000s. And it's been great, about 15 years now working and serving the Okanagan for the most part, Western Canada. but it's a big country and we're looking uh, to help, you know, all provinces. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Jamie. Okay, I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to Linaj Kumar, RCIC from Walrus. Linaj, tell us a bit about your background. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> My bad there. Okay. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, Linaj Kumar. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, depending on which part of the world you are from. Uh, so thanks for having me in this session, Chelsea. And so my name is Linoj Kumar again, and I'm CEO of uh, Walrus Immigration and Citizenship Services. So again, I'm a member of Good Standing in uh, um, Canadian Immigration Consultants Regulatory Council. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, all of you for joining here, uh, and also congratulate all the organizers for this event, Chelsea and team. Uh, primarily because I, I really believe that these kinds of programs on an ongoing basis basically would uh, really help uh, uh, three sectors connected together. One is the immigration professionals and immigration industry, BC employers and job seekers. I believe there is uh, definitely a gap there and there is a lot of room for enhancing the synergy between these three players. And I hope your programs would uh, attract more international talents to BC job market. And con congratulations and thank you. Thanks, Linaj. Okay, last but not least, we have Victor Ng, immigration lawyer from Sassaning. Victor, please tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, Chelsea, thanks. Um, not too much to add from Catherine, uh, what, from what Catherine had to say. I've been an immigration <laughs> lawyer for 10 years um, and Catherine and I have known each other and worked together for that period of time so we're uh, we're very excited to join you today and to uh to just give yeah useful information and hopefully answer some of the uh the, the burning questions that uh that your guests have uh for us so happy to be here and happy to help thanks so much victor uh thank and thanks all of you for sharing your your backstories about us and uh, now that we feel like we know uh you all four a little bit better now i've got a few of my own questions that i'm going to start us off with before we kick off with the audience q a so these next questions that i have for you are about finding work in canada and i'm going to start off with jamie first so jamie you're from Can Do Canadian Immigration Services, based out of beautiful Kelowna, BC. As many of you may know, Kelowna is in the heart of the Okanagan, uh, which hires a lot of temporary foreign hospitality and agricultural workers. Um, you must have seen a lot of immigration changes since the pandemic started. Jamie, how did the pandemic affect temporary foreign workers in BC and or Canada? Yeah, it's, it's a truly an excellent question. I think. With BC, you know, being born and raised here in British Columbia, I've got a real close attachment to the province. And I've, I've seen over the years, there's always been a need. We've always been that destination province, whether it be agro-tourism or just, you know, just tourism in general. Uh, growing up in the Okanagan as well, we saw that hospitality sector always be underserved. And um, it, it was, there was always a need. The supply demand was never, was never matching. So when the pandemic occurred, it really exposed 
how short we really are. Um, I've worked with the hospitality sector, uh, many employers, and they've said they've lost huge percentages of their workforce wow. during the last year and a half, and uh, they just can't replace it uh, with entrants not coming in and with losing that ratio. They're seeking help, and they're seeking help from outside of Canada. That's that's Canada's basis is immigration. So this is a great opportunity, I believe, for these um, these job seekers to um, really get recognized. And and this is your opportunity. Employment is is ready to go. Our economy is taking the next stage in in development, and the Okanagan is looking for people. So. It's a great opportunity, I think, for, for many to take advantage right now as uh, BC, I believe, is the top province in coming back uh, economically from the pandemic. So let's let's move forward. That's really great to hear. So Okanagan is hiring. Good news. Oh, yes. Always. <laughs> OK, next up, I've got a question for Catherine here. Catherine, great to have you back again on our panel. Uh, Catherine is a QC uh, from Sassany Immigration Law Center based out of Vancouver, BC. Catherine, can you tell us a bit about what kind of companies uh, and or industries are currently hiring international job candidates? Are there certain positions hiring more over another? What are the odds that a Canadian company will hire workers applying from outside of Canada? And it was a bit of a loaded question. It, well, it is a loaded question, and the first part that I would answer is pretty much all sectors. Um, okay. One of the one of the consequences of the pandemic is that um, people have stopped working, and several of them have said, "I don't know if I'm ready to go back to working." And employers everywhere are screaming for people to come and work for them. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the IT sector, the hospitality sector, the transportation sector, the construction and infrastructure section, the, the sector of the skilled trades, everybody is looking for people. But your, the last part of your question is what employers are looking to hire people from outside of Canada. And um, if I take a look at the, the questions that you were asking about, or you, you made reference to the finding work in Canada, the, the pivotal question is, it, it, de it depends. It's hugely different depending whether you are inside of Canada and outside of Canada. And if we look at the various people who have come into the chat room, there are a lot of people who say, and I'm currently working in Canada or I'm currently studying in Canada. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are already in Canada, you've got a huge step up in terms of your ability to connect with a Canadian employer. Um, uh, international students are, are a key sector there and, and they've got a, a foot up on everybody else. If you are outside of Canada, that is a challenge. Yeah. Um, having said that, there are a lot of sectors. Uh, I would, I think, I would go to the trucking and transportation sector first of all. They are very, very adept at reaching out and going to places, whether it be Dubai or India or Mexico or other places in Europe, to say, "We know that there are people working in these industries. We know that there are people that are keen to come to Canada, and we're going to do what it takes to try and assist them." But matching up with a Canadian employer, if you are not in the country, is the $64 million question. How do you do that? <laughs> okay, thanks for shedding a more light on this area. I, I think these questions, um, I think these are questions that everyone is, is kind of wondering about, you know, how can I, how can I get work from outside of Canada? Okay, so over to Linaj next. Um, Linaj, your business, Walrus Immigration and Citizenship Services, is based out of Vancouver as well. Can you tell us a bit more about what kind of qualifications, skills, and experiences um, that foreign workers need when applying for jobs in BC? Are there any special requirements for working in Canada? Excellent question, Chelsea. So uh, I would just start um, by saying that to all of these job seekers here, most of them probably internationally, uh, first uh, telling that please be aware of the scam offers. This is not uh, somehow related to the question, but uh, or in, in, in this profession on a daily basis, I come across um, you know, several different victims of scam offers. Okay, This is basically increasing day by day. And I think ICCRC, Government of Canada, and I think the, uh, the lawyers in Canada, they're all trying their level best to minimize this, but still it's increasing. So now remember that obtaining a job in Canada, uh, being from a foreign country is 
uh, you know, it takes reasonable amount of your efforts from both the part of an employer and from an employee. So if someone is offering you something too good to be true, please be aware of that. It could most likely be a scam because uh, I have seen people coming to me saying that, hey, this is this job offer legit. People are making job offers in the, in the, in the, in the letterhead of a Canadian employer, which would look like a legit um, a job offer. They can make fake websites and taking money from you know, lots of international job seekers. And it's, it's not only spoiling the name of the country, it is spoiling, threatening this industry. And you know, it, it's, it's bad from every single angle. So mm -hmm. I would say that uh, as a job seeker from a foreign country, please do your research and also take the help from a, you know, a professional consultant who is legally authorized to, to do so. That's number one. Uh, your question on qualifications, um, uh, right? Uh, it really depends on what kind of jobs are we, are we you know, looking for. For example, if you're looking at IT occupations here, uh, we, we, have, we have got a separate IT tech program in the BC Provincial Nominee Program for Immigration, as you know. So BC have uh, really, uh, sh BC is short of IT is one of the in-demand occupations here. So if you are looking for an IT job in BC, um, you know, an employer would likely look for relevant experience in the field. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they would definitely talk to you, have, will, will have interview with you. So if you are having some credible experience in the IT field, of course, BC have got opportunities for you. There are people who get a secure job offer from by sitting in their home country by interacting with the BC employers. And it's, it is possible, but it takes some amount of, you know, time and effort. And, um, if you look at some occupations, say for example, healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, uh, please know that some of these occupations are regulated in Canada, mm -hmm. right? In all, like, all provinces. So uh, you can only start working as a nurse after you get certified from the regulatory authority. Mm -hmm. Now you can start this process from being in your home country, but it will take some time and effort again. Now, after you get uh, certified, you can start working here. You could say, for example, something like electrician, uh, you have to either do your research or get the help of, um, you know, an immigration consultant. It's because uh, some occupations like electrician's occupation, uh, it is uh, the, the certification is not mandatory in BC when you, when you talk to BC, but in other provinces, it is mandatory. So you have to see that which provinces are you planning to move on, uh, you know, whether you need a certification before you take on a job. Right. So what I'm trying to tell is that, as my other panelists said, like there is definitely BC is recovering back fast from the COVID. Uh, we do uh, fall in short of people. Uh, now you can see for a work permit processing or LMIA processing, there are some occupations which is prioritized, for example, uh, meat processors. And we, uh, some people think that, OK, uh, we, we only look for skilled occupations. Well, as uh, Jamie mentioned, we also need semi-skilled workers and skilled mm -hmm. workers. Right, so uh, like food processing workers, for example, who are working in food processing, if you, if an employer is putting an LMIA application, if you are familiar with the word LMIA, it's processed with a priority because they are falling short of uh, employees in the food processing sector, butchers, meat cutters, uh, and also healthcare professionals and things like that. And I'll come to come back to immigration later, uh, but this is the overall picture of, uh, you know, uh, the employment demand in BC. Well, thank you, uh, Linaj. That was very interesting. Uh, so I hope everybody's taking notes on this. <laughs> okay, my next question goes back to Jamie. Uh, Jamie, are there any programs or organizations in the Okanagan that help companies hire temporary foreign workers or do employers go to immigration consultants um, when seeking to hire from abroad? I guess the question is like, how, how do companies and international workers find each other in the interior? Yeah, I think it's, interior is a little bit of a different market than mm -hmm. Metro van where there's you know, a little bit more population and a different processing. But uh, in the interior, it's, it's more of a grassroots sort of system with a lot of these employers who had brought in workers from the past and really a referral based setup. It was family, it was friends. And employers would seek to us looking for help in, in bringing these people over. Um, what we've seen happen, kind of, I want to beat the drum too much on the pandemic thing, but it's, it's true. It's really happened is that 
that has dried up, that market's really dried up. And these employers are actually um, finding workers through BC jobs, through these advertisement mediums that um, people were applying maybe for many years, but they weren't really uh, focusing too much on that as their primary um, source to fill their needs. And that's that unique opportunity I see now that's happening is that if you're a job seeker, yes, use these mediums because employers are now looking, at least in the interior, they're, they're, we're getting resumes sent to us from um, these sites saying, hey, we've got this great person, what do you think? So um, more than ever, now is the time to, um, to send your resume in, go through the, the BC jobs, and you're more likely than not going to get a response uh, from employers as they're seeking talent that mm -hmm. they cannot fill domestically. So it's, a, I, it's an opportunity uh, more so than ever right now. And I think uh, I really want to make sure that people are aware of that. Okay, good, good to know. Thanks, thanks for letting us know about that, Jamie. Okay, over to Victor. I've got a question for you. And nice to have you back on the panel as well. Victor is Catherine's partner from Sassanine Immigration Law Center here in Vancouver. Victor, can you tell us um, about the steps for getting a visa to come work in Canada? What, what kind of work visas or work permits are there? I, I imagine there's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, Ch Chelsea, you're right. There, there are <laughs> probably too many for us to cover uh, in, a, in a session like this, yeah. but I can certainly provide some high level information, just some, some, some tips for people to watch out for in terms of the kind of work that they might be looking for and, and just to have a better understanding of the of what kind of information they will need to provide in order to obtain a, a, a work permit or a work be, working visa. Um, so the first thing, just in terms of process, you know, where does one apply? How does one apply? Um, how much time will it take to process? These are going to be things that are largely dictated by um, the country of citizenship of the person, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the country of residence of the person. I, I can see that some of the um, guests here for this panel um, are some are in Canada, some are outside of Canada, and so on. So, that, so in terms of timing and process and what that looks like, it's, it's large, largely going to be driven by uh, those two factors. But in terms of the types of uh, work permits that are available out there, like I said, there, there are a lot. Um, but if I were to simplify the discussion, I would probably say this. Um, there are basically two kinds of uh, work permits, those that need job offers and, and those that don't. Um, so for jobs, uh, work, work permits that need job offers, uh, what somebody would be applying for is what we refer to as a closed permit, meaning that the individual will be applying to come work for a specific employer uh, in, a, in a very specific occupation, usually in a very specific location, mm -hmm. um, versus an, a, a, the opposite, which is uh, a, a work permit that does not require a job offer is what we would refer to as an open permit, meaning that it's open to you to come and take up whatever uh, job offers may come your way. Now, um, the latter, the open ones are, are rare, um, but we have heard at least of one or two example, uh, examples of those from uh, the panelists that have already spoken. So, for instance, um, I think Catherine had spoken a little bit about uh, students that, you know, uh, students are, there's lots of students and, and that, that it's a great way to immigrate to Canada. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because um, many students who graduate from post-secondary institutions here are eligible to get uh, an open work permit called a post-graduation work permit which is intended to uh, allow somebody who has graduated from, from a post-secondary ed uh, education here to go ahead and you know, utilize those, those skills and knowledge and talent and, and, uh, and, and get work, Canadian work experience here. Um, but by and large, I would say that most of the, um, most, most times we're going to be looking for a work permit that um, is actually supported by a job offer from a Canadian employer. Um, and that's also something that uh, has been mentioned as well. Um, that's usually done through something called a labor market impact assessment process or LMIA. Uh, Linoj mentioned that earlier. And what that process in a nutshell entails is that uh, before a Canadian employer is, is allowed to offer a position to a, a non-Canadian person, uh, whether a citizen or a permanent resident, they should demonstrate that they have made efforts to um, to recruit from the Canadian labor market first. So in other words, uh, we are offering a position to a foreign national, um, but it's it's only after we've really ex exhausted our options here in Canada. 
Um, so that requires then that the employer get that uh, authorization, uh, which then allows the, the individual who has been offered the, the position to apply for their own uh, work permit. So that is a, a closed work permit to work for that specific employer. The last thing that I would mention just um, with respect to, you know, the process of, of applying for permits is I, I would like to caution um, everybody that it's not, um, it's not quite as simple as, as just finding a job offer, mm -hmm. which is hard to say because, you know, we've already alluded a little bit to the fact that it can be difficult to get the job offer to begin with. Well, now you're telling me there's some, some other hurdles. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't think I would be doing you guys a good service if I didn't mention that, which is that um, immigration officers have a responsibility that is clearly established and written into our immigration laws that says that they must not give work permits to people if there are reasonable grounds for them to believe that the, the intended worker in Canada cannot perform the duties. Um, so I, I, for example, can just share just a recent example. I, I work a lot with uh, within the trucking industry. Uh, lots of employers here uh, are routinely able to you know, extend these job offers to uh, foreign workers from India, from Dubai, to come and drive uh, long haul trucks uh, or drive on a long haul basis. Mm -hmm. But um, but they have trouble. Uh, they don't have trouble finding people who want to come and work. But they have trouble getting these workers the, the permits um, because, mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier, you know immigration officers have to be satisfied that they can do the job. And so um, you know anyone who's interested in applying to come work in Canada should be aware that. You know that, that they will be assessed on that basis, which means, among other things, that they should have uh, or have some proof of their language proficiency, right? If you're going to work in Canada, then you should be able to demonstrate uh, strong language proficiency in English or French or both. Uh, and certainly, they should be able to back up with evidence, usually in the form of an employment verification letter that they have the requisite experience and skill set to be able to perform the duties for the job that they've been offered. So just a, a caution from me that, you know, getting the job offer is wonderful. It's great. It is can be difficult. But at the same time, uh, we shouldn't forget that, that there is an assessment process in place and that and that's going to be based on or it's going to be the responsibility of the applicant to convince the officer that uh, they have the right skills and abilities. All right, so it sounds like there are a lot of different options for, for work permits and, and some serious things to keep into consideration when, when coming to Canada. Okay, last question here for Linaj. Linaj, up until now, our, our guest speakers, our panelists have been discussing temporary foreign workers. Can you tell us more about permanent residents, uh, pathways into Canada, and if workers want, like if workers want to move to Canada permanently? Um, what do these types of workers have to do in order to get PR status? Yeah, so um, these are two different things, getting a you know, temporary uh, work permit to work in Canada and, uh, and then permanently immigrating, but they are kind of connected because once mm -hmm. you get a work permit to work in Canada, you start performing your work successfully, uh, you know, your prospects of immigration is much higher. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a lot of the, the, uh, uh, the people here uh, in their home country right now, uh, one thing I want to mention that it's not mandatory to have a job offer uh, to become a permanent resident of Canada. Uh, what does that mean is like you can directly apply for permanent immigration to Canada through so many different pathways are there. For that, you don't need to have a job offer. Of course, when you have a job offer, it would increase your prospects of immigration. Your points are increased, right? You, you will have a higher chances of getting permanent residency, but you can directly apply. So now for that, one of the most important thing, and now Victor has partially mentioned that is the English or French language proficiency, right? So uh, if you are looking at, uh, you know, one of the fastest ways of immigrating to Canada is called Express Entry Permanent Immigration Program. Uh, for skilled workers. So for that, you need to have a, a minimum uh, English language proficiency. Most of you must be aware of uh, IELTS. So IELTS, you need to have a bandwidth of around six to be eligible for that program, which is the Canadian language benchmark of seven. So uh, you need to have this either French or English language proficiency. Now, also, most probably for the approval of work permit also, uh, Victor has already mentioned, because for an immigration officer, 
the problem is that even for an employer to hire an employee from outside, you need to prove some level of a language proficiency because I'm, you know, I work in the manufacturing sector. I know like uh, how important is communication with your coworkers in order to avoid all the accidents at the workplace. So it's so important that, you know, you need to have some level of language proficiency to communicate with your coworkers and, and employers would look for that and, and immigration officer also look for that. So now, for uh, permanent immigration, as I mentioned to you, job offer would help, but it's not mandatory. You need to have some level of language proficiency, which I kind of roughly mentioned. Now, there are so many different programs for each of them. The language proficiency requirement would slightly vary depending on where you are immigrating to. Uh, now, the other thing is, of course, you will have points based on your age factor, your education factor, your experience, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, you are relatively young, say between, you know, 20 to 30, and you've got a degree and you've got a high level of English proficiency or French proficiency, I would recommend that you explore the, the Express Entry programs to, to immigrate to Canada. Uh, and, and once you are in the Express Entry profile, I always recommend my clients not to sit on it because you will be invited. I think most of you may be aware based on a cutoff score, right? Now, you can always increase your points while you are in the express entry pool. How you can increase the points? Well, you secure a job offer, you, you, have, you, you find your employer. You say, for example, you have some um, um, like credible experience in IT and reach out to an IT employer here in BC and get a job offer based on LMIA, you get 50 points or even 200 points if it's a you know, high level managerial experience, uh, sorry, job offer. So you can always increase your points if you know both languages, for example, French, you want to get trained on French language proficiency, you can get significant amount of points there. And you can come to BC, I think Catherine and uh, Victor mentioned about studies in Canada. If you come to BC while you are in the express entry pool and complete your studies, you get additional points. And after completing your studies, a lot of these programs are eligible for post-graduation work permit, but please check with the university <laughs> and the program. And uh, a lot of these are eligible for post-graduation work permit. And if you work in Canada for one year, right, you get additional points in the express entry pool. So my suggestion to all the prospective candidates is that, okay, once you create your express entry pool for permanent immigration, make sure that you keep on patiently addressing that your score to enhance your points so you are above the average cutoff points. Now that cutoff points can vary depending on the number of candidates they are inviting, right? So if you secure it now, each province in Canada has got provincial nomination program, right? I think we know BC has got BC Tech Pilot Program, which has got occupations for not only for IT occupations, if you, have, you are a graphic designer, you are a writer, author, editor, you have got 29 occupations in that BC Tech Pilot program where if you can get a job offer, you could likely apply to a BC provincial nomination. And if you secure a provincial nomination, you get a lot of points extra in the Expo Center report, which is 600 points. Most likely you will be invited for permanent immigration application. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. I think the candidates have to be just organized, get the right advice and keep addressing uh, each factor very patiently and you'll be here one day, hopefully. Thank you so much for explaining about the PR pathways, Linaj. I know that was a big question that I threw your way. <laughs> All right. Um, this information, honestly, is so, is so fascinating. I'm, I'm learning so much as your host today. Um, that was the last of my questions for, for you four. Now, I see questions are starting to come in in our chat here from our audience. So I, I think it's time to, to turn to our audience Q&A part of the event. And uh, so I invite, I invite uh, everyone here to put your questions into the chat, or you can also raise your hand and I'll select um, I'll try to select everybody in order from, from who put their question in the chat first. And, uh, and I'll invite you on screen. You can ask your question to the panel speakers. Now, you can address your question either to all four or you can, uh, you can choose one of our panel speakers to answer your question. That's, uh, that's totally up to you. So I see our first uh, question here, just scrolling back a bit. I see a question from Sunny. 
Okay, Sunny, did you want to join us on screen? Oh. Yes, I do. Uh, Hello, I welcome. <laughs> Kelsey, yeah. Um, nice to have you today, Sunny. Yes, <laughs> let me put my camera on. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's um, a pleasure. And then my, my question was posted on the chat there, but it's specifically about the job itself. Um, I have that sort of experience in higher education and colleges over 10 years of teaching. I have a PhD in management. I'm currently lecturing here in UK, uh, one of the university here in Coventry. Um, you know, it's been very difficult in terms of trying to get that job offer in Canada to teach either in college or uh, university. So what should I do? Any sort of advice? I know somebody offered an advice earlier, um, you know, very specific in terms of my case. Is there any sort of, do you have that sort of network uh, with university or colleges in terms of recruiting foreign lecturers? That's a great question. Um, does anyone, or oh, Catherine, I see, see you might know about so this. That is the quintessential problem in terms of trying to get employed um, when you are not in the country. And so I'd ask you to, for a moment, if you can, close your eyes and put yourself in the position of an employer. How is an employer going to offer you a position to work in Canada when they haven't met you, they can't see you, they don't know what your qualifications are? So I am going to make some assumptions, Sunny, and I may be wrong here, but if you're in the United Kingdom, I'm going to bet that you have the ability to come to Canada without needing a visa. And that's another big hurdle that people face. Are you from a country that does not require a visa or do you require a visa? No, I don't require a visa, but I, mm. I would have preferred to come to Canada with a job offer. Of course, mm. everybody would. You know, I would also uh, prefer to win the lottery tomorrow <laughs> as well, but I'm just having to give you pragmatic advice about what can you do. And when yeah. you tell me that you have the opportunity to be able to come to Canada to connect with potential employers, you are light years ahead of the people that come from other countries like India or China or Pakistan or the Philippines, where they can't even come here to meet with anybody without getting a visa. And when they go and tell the visa officer in their local visa office, I want to come to Canada, find a job, they go, nope, denied. We're not letting you come to Canada for that purpose. So, you know, everybody has to be pragmatic about what are the steps. Um, I can give all sorts of cliches and platitudes about life not being fair. You need to make a plan. What is your plan? Maybe you need to make an exploratory visit. And once an employer meets with you or you go to more remote regions, there are places where it may be more difficult to get lectures. If you're coming to Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and Calgary, all the positions may be full. But if you're going to more distant regions in the province or, or in the Atlantic region or just more remote areas, they may be more willing to say, you know what, Sunny, we would love to have you come and join us. Your experience looks great. We're gonna back you for that. But as an employer, and I, I say that because I am an employer, I'm not offering jobs to people that I haven't met. So that, that would be a first step that I would ask you to give some consideration to. Thank you, Catherine. I was in Vancouver. I think I was in Vancouver two years ago for about two. I was there for like two, two weeks, two to three weeks. Um, I kind of, you know, that's why I sort of developed the interest of joining this forum, you know, to see what could be, you know, what is available, what advice could be offered. And that's very interesting advice you've given me. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have to be very pragmatic, like you've just said. I'll take that approach and see how it works out for me. Thank you. Sunny, that is a gem that is applicable to everybody who's tuned into this program. Everybody has to be pragmatic about what are your circumstances, what is your reality, and what are the options that you face if this is something you really want to accomplish. Okay. Oh, Jamie, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I just want to just add on a little yeah, bit sure. to what Catherine said. I'm not sure if Sunny's still there. It was really was great advice. Take, you know, take that, take the reins and go with it. And, but it's also to understand the industry, Sunny, that you're in, in the teaching industry in itself is not a uh, an easy entrance 
um, type of work. It's it's mm -hmm. been dominated a lot in the unionized environments and very very closed circuit um, to hire. So even Canadians here, it's a difficult task for someone who's gone to school and wants to become a teacher or university professor to to get this position. Now you being as a very educated man, you know, obviously cultured, living in different countries and done well. That, that advice she's given you is, is key. Um, you have to take that step. It's not for everybody. Now, th this is one part I would say is that other, other industries, they will hire without knowing the, the person. The, the food industry is very common in that industry. The trucking industry, as Victor said, is very common in that. If the, if the job itself is in such demand that the employer cannot um, find somebody, they're willing to take that risk. And then those people who are from these countries that need visas and can't come here and do these, these visits, there's an opportunity for them um, just through putting their resumes through and interviewing with the employers and, and, uh, and going through LMIs like uh, my colleague uh, Linaj discussed. So in your industry specifically, just to summarize, you are facing some other challenges. But um, I think Catherine mentioned Atlantic provinces and things like this, some of these other um, places in the country where uh, the demand is not as great as it is in the West do provide um, various times of year uh, lists of occupations that they're looking for to really um, support um, and your education. You may have an opportunity there or in a private school or something like that. So uh, you've got some challenges, but you've got the magic visa you don't need so, come thank, on you, down. thank you Demi. i appreciate yeah. that thank you You're i think uh linage might might want to add on to this yeah question. you know i totally agree with Catherine on the pragmatic approach and jamie on the difficulties with this academic sector and career uh, now, Sunny, I feel you, uh, you got a PhD and you must be wondering why not. Uh, now, I really recommend you uh, uh, creating an express entry profile because you have got PhD, it's, a, it's got the highest qualification you can think of and you've got, got the highest point, at least for education, I believe. Uh, so I don't know uh, the other factors there, but I definitely encourage you to create an express entry profile and explore the permanent residency program. Now, uh, having a career in the academic sector, being a permanent resident, I would believe is much higher than you are trying from, you know, right now from England. And I also recommend, I'm a PhD graduate of U University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Uh, so I, I kind of know what you are talking about now. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, really, it really depends. Now, I also recommend you to, Talk to the faculties like, the, you know, we have got uh, great universities in Canada. Talk to these professors and explore the option of coming here as a postdoctoral fellow because you got your, your PhD completed. And a postdoctoral experience is something you may want to explore. Now, once the, the, the academic community works in such a way that if you are in that community for a certain period of time, people would come to know you, people know your skill set, your research experience, publications, then your likelihood of getting onto a college as an instructor or a professor in the university is much, much higher. Now, uh, I think uh, for, for being a postdoctoral fellow in a university, uh, university doesn't have to go through this LMIA and those kind of processes. I think it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's a significant benefit Canada exemption for LMIA, I believe. And, you know, you can directly apply for a work permit if you get a job offer from a university as a postdoctoral fellow. Something to add on. No, I Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Another approach to this. You're going down a single path. I'm a lecturer in the UK. I've got a PhD. Therefore, I must be a lecturer in Canada. Says who? You are a highly educated person in the field of management. Management is a very diverse um, uh, education that you can apply to other sectors. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a shortage of managers in many, many sectors uh, throughout Canada. And you've got to take a look at various other regions. You may, as I said to you before, think about the smaller, more remote regions. Take your management education and apply it to something practical in the private sector and get your foot in the door. And then 
you've got time once you're here to figure out how do you go back to being a lecturer if lecture if that's what you choose to do but you got to think outside the box it's not a linear process thank you Patrick. <laughs> I hope we answered your questions today. I think, I think you do, Chelsea. <laughs> That's very broad. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. OK, um, next up, I'm going to invite Matt Schneider. Um, he, they asked a question earlier in the chat. Matt, did you want to come on screen here and uh, ask your question to our panelists? If Matt is still here. Um, if not, I can read out Matt's question. Um, Matt says, I'm currently working for a Canadian employer as a freelancer. How easy is it for Canadian employers to sponsor workers over here? Should I wait until I've worked with them for more than two years before asking, or can I ask and start the process now? I think there's more questions and answers in that. Yeah. There, but <laughs> It's, I think I'll mail this jump in a little bit. Sure, so, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, if, if Matt was here, I could expand a little bit more on, on his situation. Like he's currently working for a Canadian employer as a freelancer. Great. Um, I'm he may be assuming it's in tech industry or graphics or something like this. I don't know, right? Where he has this ability, marketing ability, or whatever it may be. Um, he's talking about two, two years, so maybe he's got an IEC work permit or something like that. And he's he's already has a, an LMI exemption, and he's and he's got the work experience. So take advantage of that time. Do not uh, do not hold back and wait till it expires and then start the process. If you're educated, which he may likely be, if if that is my assumptions are correct, and he um, has some experience in this work. He could be a great express entry candidate. He could be gaining that Canadian experience that we're talking about where he doesn't even mm -hmm. have to use a BC program, uh, PMP program and go straight through express once he gets his 12 months with good English education, Canadian experience, foreign experience. That's kind of a magic recipe for what the, and then age, uh, you know, 18 and 35 ish um, is the sort of the magic numbers or, or calculation computation that will make him a high candidate. So I always, I always tell my clients, don't, don't wait. Uh, things change, programs change, they open, they close without notice. Um, take the bird in the hand. If you're working, uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we don't know what immigration is gonna be tomorrow. We don't know if there's gonna be another pandemic and, and the whole immigration system's thrown into disarray and, and nobody knows what to do at that stage. So I always say, uh, you know, work with what you've got. And it sounds like he's a qualified young man. He's got an opportunity and he should, uh, should not wait. Okay, so I hope you got that, Matt. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Before we move on, I see Matt's question, which um, thanks Jamie for answering that, but I would like to take, I'd like to answer the question above it from Dane, because I think that's a really important question. Um, and it ties into what Linaj was oh. talking about with respect to scams. And Dane's question is, what about persons in Canada, but on visitor status? So mm -hmm. you can't apply for a work permit from, from inside of Canada on a work permit. There were some exceptions to that during COVID, but those exceptions are over. In order to apply for a work permit, you need to go outside of the country and you need to flag pull. Flagpole is a term of art that is, refers to leaving the country, typically to the United States, turning around the flag, coming back in and applying for a work permit. That has been discouraged dramatically by um, CBSA over the past 18, 19 months. But more importantly, there is a, an industry that encourages people to come to Canada as visitors and once setting foot on Canadian soil to go and then flagpole to get a work permit. And that is a recipe for disaster. CBSA officers are handing out five year bans for misrepresentation. I've seen people come into my office that land here as visitors having made visitor visa applications and the very same day they go to the port of entry to apply for a work permit and they get a misrepresentation finding because coming to work in Canada is not the same purpose as coming to visit in Canada. So be very, very cautious about trying to transition from being a visitor to being a worker. It's fraught with uh, 
risk. That's really good to know. <laughs> Sorry, Dane, I had missed your, your question earlier. Okay, Matt, I hope um, I hope Jamie and Catherine have answered your, your question. I can see your, your mic's not working right now. Um, the next question is for Jamie from Denik. Denik, did you wanna jump on screen and ask your question to Jamie? Oh, well, I am having difficulty with my um, camera now. No so worries. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, yeah, so, so with, with, with Denek's question here, I've, I was reading this before, and this, this is where I'm, I'm looking at this. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago when I held a different sort of seminar, and, and we need to lobby for change. And, that, and that's what we're seeing, um, I think, right now. There's a lot of antiquated policies um, you know, from several years ago that are restricting employers' ability to properly and expeditiously facilitate workers coming to Canada. Um, these programs, employers have a need. Uh, I know a healthcare center sh shuts down. My need is today. I, I'm, you know, I can't wait five months for one process and seven months for another process. And now we're really planning a year you know, ahead here. So I, I think that there is the resources there. They just have to be allocated differently. Um, as we've seen in the pandemic, they did do this with farm workers and things like this. They found a way to, to make these essential services happen. I, I believe healthcare is essential. And, and you know, of course, I believe uh, with our population where we live, uh, where I live in the Okanagan, um, it's very much a retirement center, but there's a lot of youth injection in the last 20 years. So we've gotten a good balance, but there is a, there is a need where there, there's you know, understaffed. And um, I think we need to really, and what I'll be doing in the future is um, reaching out to our members of parliament, lobbying for change, for a, a more transparent and clear process to, to get these qualified people, uh, like from the Philippines, care aides, caregivers, um, to these jobs that are here. It's not that the jobs aren't here, they're here. This place is closing because they don't have enough. It's not that they don't have the demand to uh, run their business. They don't have the workers to run their business. And that's a sad state uh, for any employer that has to shut down, not because of demand, but because inability to serve. And as an employer, and I, my heart goes out to them, that's not something you ever want to do. Mm -hmm. So this kind of all comes back to if you are outside of Canada, if you are looking for work in whatever sector it may be, now is the time to apply. Apply to the job boards. Employers are looking and they're willing to take a risk that they potentially didn't before at the same level. Uh, and, and sectors that were predominantly um, hiring locally, they are now reaching into these sectors saying, we got to find workers, you know, like wh wh where can we, where do we start? And we say, start by looking at your job bank, looking at your BC jobs, looking at what's coming through organically. Mm -hmm. There could be some quality people there. And then you reach out to, you know, professional such as myself and my colleagues here on the panel, and we can help sort of walk through the complications and navigate through this you know, uh, immigration spider web of you know, country and process and regulation and uh, ensure that no mistakes are made because as, as I think Michael mentioned before, or sorry, Victor, uh, my apologies, Victor, he, um, you know, one mistake on even a work permit can, can fail the whole process. So you can be successful on the left-hand side and, and pat yourself on the back. We've got an LMIA, good job. And then if you don't hire a professional to assist you on that work permit, all for naught. And you maybe waited six, seven months for a no. So we don't want that either. So it's, I think it's important to use professionals and you know, kind of going back, circling back to what uh, Danik was saying. Um, I think we have to reach out to our, our MPs and those in government to mm -hmm. have some reform because we are in a different economic climate than we were um, two years ago or five years ago. I hope that answers your, your question, Denik. Okay, our next question, which is addressed to me, but I'll, I'll pose it to the panel speakers um, from Man Fung. 
about the the special pathways for Hong Kong residents to become peer to Canada. Um, Man Fung, did you want to jump on screen here and uh, ask your question to our panel speakers? Oh, and uh, you're you're on mute. I did see you there. Oh, your mic's not working. Okay. No problem. Let me let me read out the question here so that everybody can hear it. So Man Fung is saying the IRCC offers a special pathway for Hong Kong residents to become PR. Uh, I would like to apply to the Stream A program, a two-year diploma at a designated learning institute. My question is, I received a Canadian bachelor degree in 2013, which some of the credits are transferable to the current diploma. If I transfer the credits, I will finish the diploma shorter than two years. Will the transfer credits affect my eligibility for the Stream A program? Thank you. would have to say that I can't fully answer that. That's one of those uh, difficult situations <laughs> where you have to do the research. I, I haven't actually worked with a Hong Kong applicant as of yet. And so lots of times when people ask us questions, we have to say, we have to be candid and say, sorry, I don't have a specific answer for this. We'd have to dig in and figure out what the answer is. But the good news is there's a program and they're being facilitative to Hong Kong applicants. So mm -hmm. I would think that there would be a way of resolving this. Do you have okay. anything to add, Victor? Well, I, I, I would add just an explanation for why it is hard to answer that question. So um, with, with our immigration programs, they are, they are the ones that have been around forever and ever. Um, the ones that are written straight into our laws that are very, very clear, you know, this is what that means and this is what that means. Um, with the Hong Kong program specifically, the challenge is that um, this program was basically created on, on the web page. <laughs> so whatever, <laughs> whatever the web page says is whatever the rules are. And the problem is when, it, when it's not written well or written clearly on the web page, um, then, then it becomes a matter of interpretation. So really the question is, um, if I don't actually study for two calendar years, do I still qualify for the program? It's a great question, first of all. Um, but I don't know, I don't have that answer. I don't have that answer because I haven't done one of these with that specific fact pattern. Um, but there are ways, there are ways to ask the minister to clarify what it means. So uh, I'd say, you know, call, call a, a you know, representative, uh, get some advice on that. It is, it is a great question, um, but it does require some additional research um, because unfortunately this is a, a policy created um, by the minister. It's not written into black and white law. So it does, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it is a, an issue that requires some interpretation. Yeah, I think I would want right. to say for Mr. Fung or Ms. Fung is that um, this is a facilitative program. The concept behind the program <clears throat> is to help people from Hong Kong to be able to become established in Canada. So I would think that this would be a situation where they would be more um, welcoming and, and tolerant and understanding than being black and white and saying, no, you don't mm -hmm. have this, therefore go back, go home. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jamie. Yeah, no, no worries. That's, I think, I think that's that's absolutely correct in that. And and, and just generally speaking, with with um, education, this sort of scenario, um, I've seen favorably when someone has studied a program, transfer credits, whether it was a um, Canadian program or not, um, they still facilitate the the education certificate, and that's that's truly what matters. Sometimes it's two thirds of the program would have to be completed um, in Canada. So it'd be the, kind of the ratio of what the foreign credit was to the Canadian credit. Um, I believe the fact that it was a Canadian education is also very promising um, for them as well. Um, so there, there is some, some high points there that I think that be something that like more likely than not, if we can get into that sort of discussion that um, they would have a, an opportunity, but, um, just as, as Victor said, it's not 
really outlined and that's not a bad thing always because then we can <laughs> we can outline how we interpret it <laughs> and maybe get some policy proper policy change <laughs> that's, that's why that's why we have jobs we we live in the gray zone <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's, it's well said yeah so yeah in closing i think that's there's hope there there's, yeah. there's some right ingredients for uh yeah. for this there, there, uh, there as jamie said there are definitely comparable or analogous situations within the um, international student program where um, the government takes a similar facilitative approach. I think Linaj, you, you might have a point yeah. to add. I'll just add, so, so the take home message here is that to, to that prospective candidate is to contact one of us in the panel or uh, a professional consultant uh, to get an idea because we cannot, we have to look at these programs specifically and see how much you have completed, uh, you know, how much can be transferred and things like that. So there is generally, you know, you should have at least completed 50% of the studies in Canada based on the program requirement. And so we will have to see your studies and, you know, the, the other details of whether it is a diploma or what it is and now as Catherine mentioned there is a very good chance right now there's a lot of opportunities for hong kong and government of canada is willing to help you establish in canada there are different programs there is even open work permit for hong kong graduates which you don't necessarily to be graduated from canada you can be a hong kong graduate mm -hmm. so so basically i i would suggest you to you know conduct one of us or any other professional consultant and discuss with them your case and they would uh, advise you accordingly so it sounds like there is hope for your situation, Manfeng. Okay, thanks for your question. And I'll just move on to the next question here from Renzo. Renzo, did you wanna jump on screen and ask your question to the panel speakers? Yes, hi everyone, how are you? Well, my question is, what's the difference between an open work permit and a closed work permit in Canada? Well, I'm industrial engineer from Peru. Um, I already got like a couple of interviews and if everything goes okay, I would like to which uh, work permit should I, should I apply? Okay, great question. I think Victor was talking about this earlier. Um, I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about this again, Victor. Yeah, I can just jump in and, and maybe provide a little bit of extra information. So, um, I mean, the difference between an open permit and a closed permit, just in terms of what it allows a person to do with it, um, is, is very straightforward. And, and I had spoken about that a little bit already, but just to reiterate, an open permit is, is a permit that allows the person who holds it to, to engage in any occupation um, a, a, that they want. Um, of course, they'll need a job offer, you know, somewhere to work, obviously, but um, generally speaking, it's, it, it means your, your occupation is open to you to, to select. It means the location is open to you to select. In some cases, you might see something that maybe restricts you to a certain part of the country, but generally speaking, it, it's open. Closed, um, on the other hand, is, is uh, one that restricts you to working uh, for a specific employer or for a specific, uh, for a specific occupation um, and so on. So uh, in terms of what it allows you to do, it is really basically as simple as that. The, the complicated part though uh, comes in when you're starting to talk about who can get what. Um, so uh, I can expand a little bit more about what I was talking about earlier in terms of open work permits. So what I had said earlier was um, you can, the, some people can get them, but the, the, the opportunities to get open permits are uh, rare or few and far between. Uh, just, for, just for today, I can list a couple of different common scenarios where people are entitled or eligible to apply for one. Um, but as, as I start to list them out, I'm, I'm sure people will start to get a sense that, oh, that's really narrow. Like that's a very specific sort of situation. And unless if I fit in that, into that sp very specific situation, I probably ha only have the option of getting a closed work permit. I guess that's the, probably the best way to put it. So some common examples of situations where people, are, people can get an open permit, because it sounds great, right? On, on paper, <laughs> it sounds great. Oh, work anywhere I want. And you know, work for anyone I want. And, and by the way, that includes working on your own business. <laughs> uh, an open permit is flexible enough to allow you to, you know, do your own business. So there's just things like that. So on paper, it looks great. It sounds great, um, but they are hard to get. So some common examples include um, uh, what we call the working holiday uh, permit. Um, 
that's uh, Canada's youth exchange program. We, we have signed onto agreements with uh, various countries where we say, if you, if you allow our young people to come to your country, our young people as in Canadians, to come to your country and, and have these open permits, then we will do the same for you, for, for your citizens. Um, so we've signed on to countries like Mexico, um, Australia, and so on. Um, but you have to meet, you know, certain requirements. You have to be of a certain age. Usually it's around 30 or under 30. Um, some countries offer under 35 or 35. I don't remember which one. Um, that's one example. Uh, another example would be if, um, I know we talked about students earlier, um, so if, if somebody's spouse, for example, is going to school here in Canada, they're going to university, um, then uh, the, the spouse who is coming along with them can also uh, apply for uh, one of these open work permits. So um, these, are, these are two common you know, scenarios where people are allowed to uh, get them. But as you can see, very, very specific, very narrow situations. Um, so for the most part, uh, most people will be coming based on a closed permit which basically means that um, they need to have an employer uh, put forward a specific occupation or a specific job offer to them. And usually that requires some sort of um, uh, vetting process by the government before that offer can be made to that person. Um, Jamie had touched on this a little bit earlier when he was talking about, you know, it can take several months for process A and then several months for process B. Well, that's, that's what he's referring to is, Usually, uh, or in many cases, when, when a Canadian employer is willing to make a job offer, one that a person, a candidate can use to apply for their own work permit, it actually requires the, the Canadian employer to have that job offer vetted first, usually through that LMIA process we had touched upon earlier. Hey, I, hope, so much, uh, that, I hope that cleared up your question, Renzo. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, just to oh, one sure, add on to that. It. Yeah, just on, like I was just checking a little bit when well while they were going through the Victor was discussing that, but I think Renzo said was from Peru. I'm mm. not sure if I heard that yes. correctly. Yeah. I think we have a free trade agreement. Yeah. So we don't require an LMIA for some exactly. jobs. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I was gonna say. If you if you're on one of the occupation list, then that could be maybe a little more expeditious process than going through an LMIA or whatever else it may be, but that would be contingent, of course, on your occupation and being on that list. But it's, it's definitely a less arduous process than an LMIA, um, you know, that type of a job offer when it's um, through one of these uh, agreements uh, similar to NAFTA. Well, mm -hmm. in, the, in the world of work permits, the starting point and the point from which every immigration professional uh, cringes is the labor market impact approach. <laughs> assessment approach. Nobody likes that. It's the least user-friendly approach that there is. It's the most expensive. It's the most time-consuming. It's awful. So then we look for what are called exemptions from the LMIA process, and the free trade agreements are exemptions from that process, as are intercompany transferee work permits and other types of work permits. But a free trade agreement work permit is still an employer specific work permit and whether Peru or Colombia or Chile or Korea or um, any of the various agreements or places have agreements, you still need an employer saying we want to offer you a position as X. And each of these agreements has a schedule which identifies which occupations are um, eligible. Uh, you, it's interesting to read some of the, these agreements. And, and if you look at the older ones, which include um, the NAFTA agreement, now called the CUSMA agreement and the Chile agreement, they're virtually identical. And they have a list of professions, predominantly academics and scientific occupations, which you may apply under this heading. Then when you go to take a look at Venezuela and Peru, they have a, you cannot apply. These, these occupations are not eligible to apply. So it's an exclusive list. And then there are a list of occupations which may be approved and they tend to be in the technical, the technician, the trade, the construction sector. I like to th say that these agreements were put together closer to when Fort McMurray was in its glory days and it was to facilitate bringing workers into Canada on a very expeditious basis. If you take a look at the more recent trade agreements, they're all very, very different in how they approach what workers can come to Canada. Thank you so much, Katherine. Um, Jamie. 
Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for your question, Renzo. Okay, our next question is from Clayton, um, and they're asking you about IELTS scores. Uh, Clayton, did you want to jump on screen and ask your question? If not, I can I can always read out your your question here. So their question is, uh, what would be the minimum IELTS score to use? But I'm not sure what for what program that is. Doesn't matter. Okay. So, so here's the issue with IELTS. Forget about IELTS. Learn what um, Linage made reference to earlier. What is the Canadian language benchmark? Now, one of the big differences between the CELPIP test and the ILETS test, which are the only two tests that IRCC accepts or are trained to understand, is that CELPIP very cleverly has done its scoring exactly on the same level as the Canadian level benchmark. The ILETS, I guess it's a legacy from the Brits. They've always got to do everything in a convoluted <laughs> way. You've got to convert their scores to see how they compare to the Canadian level benchmark. It is generally correct, which Lenage said, that if you get a, an ILETS 6 in a general test, it's going to equate to a CLB 7. But uh, the other thing that drives me bananas is people say, oh, I've got a general overall ILETS test of 6.5. <laughs> I don't care what your overall general test is. You need to know the points for each of the four different criteria, reading, writing, speaking, uh, comprehension, to be able to score your points for pretty much anything. So, so you need so. to be able to figure out what is the Canadian level benchmark equivalency for ILETs. That's the first <laughs> point. The second point, you Catherine, really can need- I, Can I sure? cut you off there for a second? Okay. So um, I guess, first of all, the, the answer is always going to be the higher, the better, right? The, we, don't, we don't really operate on a minimum system. We operate on a points system, merits-based system. The higher is always the better. Um, it's, like, it's like money, you know? You have a little bit, it's great. If you have more, it's even better. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like that. Now, um, the other thing though, Clayton, to, to clarify for your um, question is somebody may ask that question um, for, uh, for immigration, immigration permanent residency purposes, um, but also for work purposes, you know, because I had mentioned, for instance, that, um, earlier that language profici proficiency or proving it is, you know, really important even to get a work permit. So, um, you know, that's, that's also something to consider is, um, is, is are you, are you asking for work or are you asking for immigration? Um, but to, to Catherine's point, um, because we operate on a system where, you know, the more points that you get or the stronger your language is, um, the more likely you will be eligible to qualify for permanent residency. The answer is always going to be um, the better you do, uh, the more that you stand out, the more that your profile stands out, the more that your, your application will have a greater chance of success. And because most of the people that consult us, even if they're saying, how do I get a job in Canada? Or how do I study in Canada? The ultimate goal is going to be, how do I live in Canada permanently? So even if the threshold to get a job or to get studying in Canada may be lower, to get permanent residence, it's going to be higher. And the minimum score that anybody should consider having for permanent residence is a seven, a CLB seven for each and every factor. And ideally it would be nine because that's the most points that you're going to be able to get in the express entry calculation system. So yeah. seven at a minimum, nine is a maximum. You can get up to 12, but you're not going to get any more points after 10 or 11. You just get the maximum points there. Yeah, just this, yeah. There, is, there was this year some new programs, though, like that brought hope for those that couldn't ever get it. Right. And we should touch on those, hoping that we'll see them again. Right. So these are the, the TR to PR categories where four was OK, um, you know, for a non healthcare uh, essential type of job or five for a graduate. So for someone that, you know, yes, that skilled candidate, they got to go, you know, express entry. You need six or unless you're Canadian experience, you can have a little bit of blend. But, uh, you, you know, more the better. 
uh, just as, as Victor said, you're expressible, you know, you know, double a score on your language, you know, with just a little bit higher. But um, there are programs that we're seeing now, at least this year we did, that, that catered more to those that couldn't speak as well. And I, I thought that was great. It was now the farmer can have an opportunity. The gas station attendant can have an opportunity. The cleaner can have an opportunity that is an essential worker to our country, but they're being left out of the skilled worker system. So I think, I think we're seeing a change, maybe a recognition of uh, what is an essential worker in our country and that uh, language is not always the highest definition of that person and um, and the, if you, you have an opportunity whether it's your wife has an open work permit you can score four you can be in a general occupation um, like the aforementioned that I discussed you've got a chance to get your immigration in 2021 and I hope I see that going forward in uh, in the future as well. I think Elena, I, you've I, got a point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a few more points here. Uh, one is um, now, as Catherine mentioned, CELPIP is way more straightforward. So you can really equate that to the CLB benchmark much better. Now, IELTS, um, unfortunately, most of these uh, international candidates here, they don't have the CELPIP centers in many cities around the world. That's so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And most of them have to go through the IELTS system. Uh, now for express entry, as my panelists mentioned here, you need to have uh, encouraged to have seven or higher. The highest is better, you have more points. Now there are programs all across Canada, for example, Atlantic programs. You don't need to have a CLB seven, like CLB four, CLB five is accepted. And there it is not based on a point system. So, uh, so there are some programs which uh, you can try to explore in different parts of the country where uh, your lower language proficiency would be accepted. But I always uh, encourage, I mean, there are sometimes clients who ask me that, how can I come to Canada without English? Now, remember that you are coming to a country whose uh, first language of uh, you know, communication is English and then French. So you are expected to have some level of English communication skills here in order to do your job uh, efficiently and also communicate with uh, the community around. So obviously, and now there are some programs with uh, five or more points where you could be accepted and by express entry, of course, it's going to be higher, the better as uh, Jamie and Catherine and Victor mentioned. Okay, I hope that that answer your question, uh, Clayton. Our next question is from Paola. Uh, did you wanna jump on screen and ask your question if you're still here? Hi, all. Hello. Uh, well, my question is, uh, which immigration pathway is best suited for a uh, four-year-old person? Because I've been sitting in the express entry pool for almost two years without any success, and I'm losing many points because as I age, uh, well, I'm a graphic designer. I already have a master degree in information technology. Uh, and well, I would like to know which other options I have. Great question. I would say the pathway that is best suited for you is the one that you're eligible to qualify for. And so that requires sitting down and, and reviewing what your scores are and identifying what are the ways that you can increase your point scores. Now, you're not likely going to be able to increase your, well, you're not, your, your points for age, as you recognize, are going to decrease. Uh, so you can increase points in areas such as language, you can increase points in education, you can increase points in foreign work experience, and you can increase points in Canadian experience, work, work experience. And so then if, you, if you've maxed out in all your other point capabilities, you have to say, how do I get to Canada to get some Canadian work experience? Maybe there's an international postgraduate program that you could take for a one-year postgraduate diploma. A one-year postgraduate diploma in Canada is going to increase your points for studying in Canada, and it's going to make you eligible for a postgraduate work permit, so now you can get one year of Canadian work experience. You may not be able to remain in Canada constantly throughout the process after you finish your one year of work experience, but that's not the end-all and be-all. You can always go back to your home country and apply for express entry and then come back after that. Yeah, so I mean, that's a good good starting point for the conversation because we see a lot of people come to our office and, and they have the same problem. I, I don't score enough points, but 
everybody's case is a little bit different and unique because it really matters um, how many points you have um, for us to sit down and say, uh, how far are you off? Because sometimes it is as simple as retaking the ILS test or the cell PIP test. Um, I famously had a client who just simply refused and he missed out on an invitation and then I get to say, I told you so uh, to him. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're really, if the gap is really big, um, Paula, and then, then really the most likely, right, the bigger the gap, the more uh, dramatic the solution has to be, the more work that has to be done uh, in order to bridge those points or to, to get those extra points. So for someone who is older, uh, and it depends, of course, on, on if you're here in Canada or not, but for someone who's typically older, who's 40, uh, in their 40s or even 50s, um, we certainly at our office have had a great deal of success uh, in terms of helping clients, you know, make up those extra, the, the, with the shortfall with, um, through, the, through the provincial nominee program. Um, in British Columbia, our provincial nominee program is, in my opinion, excellent because, um, and this, is, this really echoes what Jamie's been saying all, all afternoon, um, I, I see the provincial nominee program, at least in British Columbia, as being more pragmatic, as being more realistic in terms of, hey, what is a good, what is a good immigrant look like? What does a strong, you know, candidate to immigrate look like? They don't all speak great English. What if, what if, what if they have great skills? You know, what if they have tons of experience? Um, so, so the provincial nominee program is, in my opinion, more reflective um, of that. So, they, for example have a scoring system similar to express entry, but they don't look at a person's age. Rather, um, you can score a tremendous number of points um, based upon your salary. Uh, and, and, this, and I raise that point because someone who earns a higher salary or is offered a higher salary tends to be someone who's more experienced. Someone who's more experienced tends to be someone who's older. Um, the other thing about the provincial nominee program is, and other panelists have spoken about it as well, um, we have a short list of people that uh, a short list of 29 occupations that if you work in these uh, specific occupations and you're being offered a position in these specific occupations, um, we make it even easier um, to, to for an employer to offer that position to you and for you to, to you know, be supported. So um, that that is something certainly worth considering. That's just kind of interesting. I wonder if graphic designers is on that list. <laughs> yes, it, it is on the list. That's what I was yeah. <laughs> I think but, it is, yeah. But, but another well, option, Paula, for you to consider is whether you would go back to school. Um, BC's PNP program, in, in my view, and I'm not um, uh, humble at, about this at all, I think it's the best that Canada has to offer. And there is a program within our BC PNP program called the International Postgraduate and if you graduate from one of those master's or PhD programs, you are automatically eligible to apply for permanent residence in British Columbia with no work experience and with no employer. So when you tell me that you are a graphic designer, I would ask you to take a look at the list of eligible programs of study and see, can you get a position in computer science? Would, would be, that be something that you are able to do? And certainly taking a master's degree when you are in your mid to late 40s. I've had clients in, in their early 50s graduate from master's and PhD programs, and they still get their permanent residence through the international postgraduate program. It's an excellent program. Did you have any more to add on, Lenach? I, I see your hands. Um, no, no, I was just uh, trying to tell that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's eligible for BCPNP tech. So I would suggest her to hit the ground running uh, to, if possible, to secure a job offer from an IT employer in BC. Now, uh, Catherine gave a fantastic advice. Now, BC has got a very good postgraduate program for PNP that would provide her 600 points after her graduation. So uh, look for suitable programs in BC in suitable academic institutions. It's not unusual for people in late you know, 40s, for example, to graduate from a BC post-secondary institution. So uh, you know, I completely agree with other panelists to, to, to explore all the opportunities. Now, there are a lot of candidates like this because before the COVID time, your express entry cutoff score was very high. And those uh, candidates were all waiting in the pool. Almost their profile is getting expired and that's so unfortunate. Now, that doesn't mean that the cutoff score doesn't 
you know go below a certain point right i, I think they need more people i can like planning to take 400000 immigrants which means 33000 a month i believe is is going to be coming to canada so i think the points could could go down so it doesn't i don't know how many points she has but if it is a little bit uh, here and there so there's a good possibility that it could come down but having said that try to explore opportunities of increasing your profile score through one of these ways thank you okay thank I you think... very much for your answers thanks for your question <laughs> i think we've got uh time for one more question today and i'm gonna ask patricia if you want to come on screen here and ask your question if you're still here patricia Patricia Garcia. No, I think they've left. Okay, uh, in that case, I'll scroll down to the next one. Um, Varun, Varun, are you still here? Okay, no, I'm just gonna go down to uh, Tresor. Okay, possibly they've left. Uh, Ruth? Um, hi, hello. Sorry, please pardon me. I can use my video. It's about- Oh, no night. worries. <laughs> oh, midnight. Oh gosh, it's quite late yeah. for you. <laughs> so I actually asked, um, let me just give a, a quick background. So I intend to get married. And uh, so my fiance is living in Vancouver, BC to be precise. So. I actually am trying to apply for a PR. So as a, in my background of finance or finance, I wanted to know what is my possibility of getting a job offer or um, in the area of the BCPNP, what is uh, my chances, especially if I have an express entry um, profile in the finance uh, industry. What country are you from, Ruth? Um, I'm, I'm Nigerian, but I'm currently in Hungary, Budapest. Oh, excellent. I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, st stop at fiance in Canada. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, that's all I heard, but you know, in all, in all seriousness, I mean, that, that's a, that's a great, it is a great opportunity, you know, for the, that spousal sponsorship to get an open work permit and make yourself, um, available to, to work and get that job obviously you want to hit the ground running and, and have that, you know, when you land there and being an educated young woman, um, yeah. finance, yeah, it's gonna, it's, it's just one of those industries. Like we look in the banking and the finance industry, <laughs> it's tough to, to break into. It's very remote, very uh, automated in, in certain senses. And that traditional sort of finance is, is sort of that sector is shifting a little bit. I think it's, you're, you're more benefit in getting that position when you can make yourself available to work mm -hmm. for those institutions um, and uh, kind of focusing that direction. I, I mean, higher level banking jobs, we can see there are some, uh, some of the banks are using the programs, PMPs and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, but they, it would just be contingent on what level of experience that you have. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think Canada is yeah. in your future, no matter what. That sounds <laughs> awesome, and um, you know, I think I think maybe applying to some of these um, job, you know, these advertisement mediums, you could see mm -hmm. something in the uh, in the job field open up. It's just a, it's not a, a typical, in my experience, sector that is um, you know designed for immigration. I guess you could say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, someone else may have a different opinion, but that's mine. Okay. Um, I just wanted to offer the floor to our panelists for any um, closing remarks that you might have before I give my closing remarks today. So if you have any other information that you want to add, or if you want to maybe put even put your websites, um, the links in the chat for, for our attendees to check out, that would be great too. Um, but yeah, if you have any information or any last comments that you want to share with anybody with our with our audience today, now's the time. Yeah, I think I'll just finish off there that, you know, it's just you've got a great panel here, I think, of breadth of knowledge. And, um, you know, I listen to each person really um, explain in detail 
um, you know, different strategies. Immigration is about, it's about strategizing. It's not just black and white, cut and dry. This is how you get it done. It's, it's essential to build a plan, um, have some forethought into, you know, my timelines. And, and just as that one of the last people stated, stated two years, I've been waiting. There's mitigating factors. I mean, just take 2020 off the map, 2021, pretty much those last two years are, are a wash. I'm, I'm looking at unless you're already in Canada under that program. So um, it's, you know, you can't turn off the Canadian immigration tab for more or less two years and then just recover immediately. There is gonna be a demand. The numbers are gonna go up. The, ex the outside Canada applicants are, are attractive to Canada. They just had to serve those in Canada because of the border restrictions and uh, the inability for people to come in. So I really believe there's an opportunity for those who are outside of Canada apply, you know, this is a BC jobs forum, apply, right? Go, you'll seek the forum, look through the forum, look at your positions, um, apply to them. Now you, it'll be more receptive than it's ever been. And then once you're here, the, there's uh, PMP programs, express programs that make it probably quite easy to get your immigration. So keep the faith. Uh, Canada is open for business. It is open for immigrants. And I, I see a strong 2022 um, in our future. Well, I agree with uh, Jamie. Uh, it has been wonderful to have, uh, you know, share this session with all the panelists. And I think Canada is going to have lots of opportunity for you guys. Uh, uh, but first and foremost, uh, be very patient, uh, patiently address uh, your each pathway, okay? So don't, um, you know, stay on your profile, uh, just keep increasing your profile score. Uh, please reach out to employers, BC Jobs, Job Bank, um, reach out to employers, they need you guys and uh, keep applying for positions. And once you secure a positions, you can be here on a temporary work permit. Eventually you are on your way to permanent residency if everything is uh, working out okay, or come here for studies. It's a, uh, you know, Catherine has very well mentioned the importance of studies in Canada and gradually getting into a, a, becoming a PR. So address each of these patiently and it's not a linear process as other panelists mentioned. So uh, hopefully we will be able to help you. Please reach out to us if you need any help with regard to immigration or uh, you know, getting a job offer or getting a study permit and things like that. And wish you all good luck. Hopefully, you will be able to, uh, you know, share this message with your friends, family, coworkers, and we look forward to getting in touch with all of you. Well, my advice would be um, do your homework and be tenacious. You know, learn as much as you possibly can about the various processes. Every time you go to a different website, every time you participate in a program such as this, you're going to learn another one or two nuggets of information that are going to help you on your journey. Um, it takes a lot of courage to become an immigrant. It takes a lot of courage to move to a new country. And if that's what you really have as your goal, then you have to set your sight on that and be tenacious about pursuing it. Okay. Well, Catherine, Victor, Jamie, Lenage, it was an absolute pleasure to have you all on our panel today. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules uh, to join us. Um, if anyone is looking for immigration assistance, I highly recommend reaching out to our panelists today. Um, they, their websites, um, if they're not in the chat, they, they were in the um, promotional emails that you may have received and on the Eventbrite uh, where you signed up. So you can find their website links there as well. Um, final thoughts or final remarks from BC Jobs. Don't forget to join us this month on November 22nd for our next guest speaker panel series with Hootsuite, Spare Labs and Traction on Demand. Um, there will be hiring managers there. You can also ask questions about, um, you know, what kind of jobs they're hiring for and uh, learn some tips on networking, uh, how to draft your resume and some interview tips as well. Um, you can also shoot me an email to uh, events at bcjobs.ca if you have any questions. We hope you found this panel informative 
and helpful for your immigration purposes and uh, hope to see you all next time. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you so much and have a great week, everyone. Thank Stay you, everyone. Safe. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay.